Good morning, and thank you for joining us. My name is Autumn McDonald, and I am the head of New America California. New America is a think and action tank based out of DC. New America's California efforts focus on economic equity, as well as community voice and agency. We are really focused on what it looks like to incorporate the lived experiences of those who are impacted by various issues in making sure that that drives policy and systems change. We hold forums like this to, with an eye on community needs, as well as disruptive solutions and policy influence. We are happy that you are here to join us this morning or afternoon based on where you are uh, as we discuss gig workers and propositions. Uh, policies changing nature of work and policies, excuse me, and change the changing nature of work's interplay. Please feel free, free to take this conversation online by uh, using the hashtag gig work or hashtag policy and tagging New America California, and as well as our speakers. Our guests today include Kim Jacobs, who is the chair of the UC Berkeley Labor Center. Cecilia Munoz, who is a senior advisor at New America. Mary L. Gray, who is a faculty affiliate fellow at the Harvard University at Harvard University and also co-author of the book Ghost Work. And Vikram Iyer, who is deputy director of the Economic and Gender Justice Division at ACLU. We will be uh, beginning this conversation in just a moment, but first I wanted to thank the MacArthur Foundation for helping make this conversation possible. And I wanted to also thank all of our speakers for joining us today. This is going to be a really great conversation and I'm glad that all of you who are tuned in are here with us as well. I've asked Ken to start us off with a brief primer on the topic so that it can kind of set a groundwork for this conversation. And with that, I'll pass it to you, Ken. Thank you, Autumn. It's great to be here with you, with everyone today. So as Autumn mentioned, I'll provide some brief background to set the stage here. So what is Proposition 22? Proposition 22 was put on the ballot by the rideshare and delivery companies who then spent uh, over $200 million to pass the initiative. And what it does is to exempt app-based workers of transportation and delivery network companies in Calif from California's employment and labor law and then creates a new lower set of standards for those workers. Since their inception, first the ride hailing and later delivery companies treated workers as independent contractors, and that shifts both economic risk and capital costs onto workers, to the drivers in this case. And it's important that we understand employment status as nothing more than a collection of rights and benefits under the law. Those rights include minimum wage, paid sick leave, protections against discrimination, the right to reimbursement for expenses on the job, and health and safety protections. And those benefits are participation in our main social insurance programs, uh, called portable benefits in terms of unemployment insurance, workers' compensation insurance, should a worker get in, injured on the job, state disability insurance, and paid family leave, among others. The first ruling in an individual case that these workers were entitled to employment rights in California was in 2015. The California Supreme Court affirmed this by creating a clearer test of employment status in the dynamics decision in 2018. And then two years ago, it was codified by the California legislature with Assembly Bill 5, at which point the companies went to the ballot. So what did Proposition 22 do? It takes away the employment rights and benefits, and as mentioned, replaces them with a lower set of standards. We estimate that under the Prop 22 standards, workers could still earn as little as $5.64 an hour without the companies being in violation of that law. Now, there is a debate about what drivers do earn or were earning prior to the pandemic. The non-company financed research consistently found that on average, drivers earned well under the California minimum wage. Company financed research always finds uh, higher amounts. But the main points of debate there was really thinking about work and how we think about uh, what is a job. The first uh, was around waiting time and whether it's commensable as it is under California law. That's the time the drivers are waiting between uh, the rides that they pick up. 
And the second key point was around expenses. Do you count the full costs associated with driving as required for other employees under, under the law? Or do you count only the marginal cost of do it, driving that extra mile? And that's connected to a larger argument that this work is made by the companies, that the work is intended to be a supplement and not a family supporting job. And there are two things to note here. First, while most drivers are casual, full and part-time drivers do most of the work and generate most of the earnings for the companies, that is drivers with 20 hours or more. But it's also the same argument that was used historically to exclude service industries with a large share of marginalized workers from protections under the Fair Labor Standards Act up until 1967, and is still used today in arguments against raising the minimum wage by companies like Walmart and McDonald's. The pandemic also made clear how essential our social insurance programs like unemployment insurance are for all workers, regardless of employment status. And there's a good argument for expanding coverage in those programs. But there's an important issue here of how it's paid for. Drivers were ultimately provided benefits through the pandemic unemployment assistance, importantly. But of course, the companies never paid into the system. And we estimate that had they paid uh, into unemployment insurance, UI taxes in California between 2015 and the start of the pandemic, they would have paid more than $400 million into that system. So what's happened since the law passed? We've already seen some companies like Albertsons outsource work. So workers lost their job and the, the work, uh, work was outsourced to app-based delivery companies. Proposition 22 importantly did not relieve companies of past obligations and there's a possibly very significant back liabilities, then that's gonna still work its way through the courts. We've seen Uber and Lyft try to expand this model to other states. And it's important to, to remember that the fact that so many people do do this work for such low net earnings is a reflection of the weakness of our overall labor market and of our social safety net system, which we need to think about in the recovery. And now we're seeing this debate move to the federal level. The Senate, in the Senate, uh, Senator Ron Wyden and colleagues have an unemployment insurance reform bill, that which would use California ABC test, like in California, to determine who's eligible for unemployment insurance benefits. And the House passed the PRO Act for labor law reform, which would do the same for the right to organize. So I think the most important thing here is this debate is not over. Thanks so much for that, Ken. That was incredibly helpful. I th thought it was really kind of set the, the table for us as we began. I wanted to also make sure to introduce Kung Fang. I apologize that I neglected to mention uh, your name. Uh, Kung is joining us from Jobs with Justice San Francisco. We are so happy to have you. I would love, Cecilia, if you would uh, kind of take us into the policy element of this. I, I have heard you describe yourself as a policy wonk. And you certainly know quite a bit about policy, domestic and otherwise. Uh, if you would please just make the kind of transition for us. What does this mean? We're talking about work, workers, how people make the, the income they need to survive. What does this mean when we, when we look at it from the policy vantage point? So first of all, thanks, Autumn, for having me. And thank you to everybody who's participating. This is an incredibly important and timely discussion. Um, I think I, I, in, it might be helpful to pull the aperture back from the really important comments that Ken just made about the very specific circumstances that we're dealing with to talk a little bit about, right, as Ken said, this question now moves to the federal level. Um, but there's also, there's a larger conversation going on around the ways in which work is changing, the ways in which the lives of workers are being transformed. And I worry sometimes that the conversation tends to land in a couple of buckets at the policy conversation. A, a lot of people have landed in the bucket of the, that I think of as like the robots are coming for our jobs and are focusing in on a policy response that it aims at training workers and perhaps, you know, emphasizing like coding and with respect to training workers. And so that's one of the places where I see a lot of track being laid in a policy conversation. And then the second bu bucket is, and I think this is where the points that, that Ken made falls, is aimed at maneuvering the existing system of worker protections or trying to create a new system of worker protections, but it's often built on the system of protections that we have been living with now for decades and trying to figure out ways to protect more workers, to use the tools that we have to make sure that workers in these kind of newer situations are protected. Um, and the, the very important debate over worker classification kind of falls in that bucket. 
And so I agree at some level, I kind of agree with both approaches in the sense that I think quality training for good jobs is tremendously important. And obviously a, a, a legal regime that protects workers to the utmost is also tremendously important. But I also think for policymakers, it's important to recognize that there are big limitations in these strategies. We're, we're not gonna train our way out of this challenge and we will need creative approaches to a legal framework that, um, that protects workers. I mean, the framework that we are trying to tweak right now is designed for what work looked like for my parents. And it may not be appropriate for the way work is transforming for my daughter's generation. So that is a very tall order for policymakers. And, um, and I'm, so I'm eager to hear what the um, other speakers today want to say to inform the conversation. I guess the last thing I'll say is that I don't think we're going to come up with effective act answers unless we are also being very deliberate about engaging workers themselves deeply in the conversation. Um, right, you know, Adam, you and I were involved in research at New America that um, where we you know, spoke directly to retail workers, for example, and they had a really interesting perspective on automation that not only were they not resisting it, they had ideas for how it should be designed. Their approach was, we actually know these jobs. We actually know how they might um, be better, like what efficiencies you can create by um, accompanying our work with the work that, that machines can do. Um, and the notion that their notion was, we should be designing how this happens because we actually know how to do this work. We actually know how what's, what's in the best interest of, of you know, what we're trying to accomplish and to better serve customers. So I guess the last thing I'll say before we continue the conversation is that this is a conversation, it should not be aimed at things that are happening to workers. It's a conversation that we have to make sure is being driven by workers. Um, and that is essential if we're gonna get to the outcomes that I think we need to strengthen, not just the role of workers in the workforce, but the, the economy and the society as a whole. Thank you so much for that, Cecilia. As you know, I couldn't agree more in terms of this being driven by those who are participating in it uh, and all of the stakeholders who are involved in it, uh, not uh, letting it be uh, something where particular stakeholders are the only ones who are um, engaged in the conversation. And so with that, I'd love to hear from you, Kung. If you would be so kind as to tell us the one minute story of you specifically as it relates to what puts you into this issue, into this conversation. Yeah, so I actually entered the labor movement as a worker um, a few years ago, or actually a while, I was, a while ago, I was a bike messenger in San Francisco. Um, I have tattoos to show from that time. I also have some stitches and some scars. Um, I have this heart-shaped scar, which is funny because the work is often romanticized, but um, I have this sort of small dent in my calf um, by my shin. And the point is, I think the conditions of work and these policies actually leave real marks on real people. I worked for a bunch of different companies. I was an employee at some. One of them, I was an independent contractor. We did the exact same work of delivering packages from point A to point B, um, but I did not make a minimum wage all the time at that job. I also, you know, I didn't even think about this until I started thinking about this for this panel, but I didn't have workers' compensation. And that was an industry where, you know, we had as much injuries as, as meatpacking. Um, we did a study last year with um, Professor Chris Benner at UC Santa Cruz of AppWork in San Francisco. We found that 80% of workers in San Francisco were people of color, right? So I just want to foreground that because it's not an economic, only an economic justice question, but it's a racial justice question where there's, these are the folks who are being excluded from worker protections. I mean, that's happened historically, right? And this is happening again. Um, Another quick story, you know, if you're in San Francisco and you walk down the Embarcadero, um, you'll see this sort of rectangular skinny pole. And you might notice it, you might not, you might walk past, but if you do come closer, you'll find out about the story about two people who were killed by police bullets not far from there. And they were killed during this general, or sorry, they were killed during 1934 in the strike at the waterfront and dock workers who were fighting the system called the shape up. And it was one of the big victories of the strike that they ended that. And it was on-demand work. People would go to the docks, line up, 
up and crowd for a day's work of worth and a gang boss would tell them you work or you starve, right? And actually, I feel like there's a lot of systems of work that are these and demand work, except now, you know, an algorithm sort of helps sort people and jobs, but the basics are sort of the same in terms of the abuses of this very precarious work. Um, and the story there, and I think it relates back to what Cecilia said, is that these doc jobs have now become one of the best blue collar jobs you can have actually. And that's because doc workers came together and they fought to make it a better job. And I think that's fundamental. You do have these questions about what protections there are, what status people have, but fundamentally, I think there's a question of what power people have. What's the power that people have together to actually change and, and shape these lives? So, you know, um, there's a lot of talk about flexibility, but I actually find that that's sort of misleading um, but there's also, it's, it's an impoverished concept, right? We really should be talking about power. We should really be talking about how people are their full selves and get to live full lives and have their full needs, not just sort of juggle and prioritize between limited choices. Um, so that's, that's my point is how I enter into this is really a question of how workers have power in their lives. Thank you so much for that Kanda. It's really important and it's great to hear your perspective individually as well as what you're seeing in terms of the needs for uh, how to influence this conversation um, and who should be influencing it all around. Vikram, I would I like to ask you to also share the one minute story of you and what brings you to this conversation. I think it's interesting because we've heard a little bit about the nature of work and how work has been changing. Uh, and we've also heard about some of the kind of challenges that exist for people who are using this, this, um, this way of working to augment or maybe fill their whole kind of income. What is, what's your take on all of this? Yeah, I, I'm sure we'll unpack a lot more of, of my full take throughout the arc of this conversation. But, um, you know, I come at this from maybe a, a unique vantage point because I ran public policy um, for one of the companies that did fund the ballot measure that, that um, Professor Jacobs spoke to. Um, I also spent time, um, like Cecilia, in the Obama administration, and more recently, as Autumn pointed out, um, now work in civil society at the ACLU. And I think that that vantage point is pretty unique um, because the challenge that has been laid out that both Ken and Cecilia spoke to is really going to take a whole of stakeholder approach. It's going to absolutely require and demand workers have a voice at the table. It's absolutely going to require and demand that labor advocates have a voice in shaping our path forward. But it's also going to demand government get involved. And it's also going to uh, demand that the tech companies themselves that have been encouraging new types of innovation and new access to work also get involved. And I think for far too long, there has been this depiction specifically on the issue of worker classification, but even on the issue that Cecilia spoke to with automation, that every few weeks, it feels like Bain or McKinsey or the America Foundation might be issuing a new report on the plight of automation and the perils of disaggregated work and kind of vilifying industry as the culprit in that. But American entrepreneurship has always celebrated the innovation. The question is, how can we ensure that government builds more empathy for technologists and technologists build more empathy for government? So that way we're not leaving workers behind, but rather giving them heightened access to new work opportunities while also invoking smart and balanced regulations to inform that. And I think that's a pretty darn epic task and it's gonna require all of those stakeholders to, to come together. Um, and particularly because since essentially World War II, we've had this system in America in which you have workers with benefits and some workers without. And I think that from an industry perspective, from a labor perspective, from a government perspective, every point of view would see that that system may not be working anymore. COVID showed us that 5.5 million Americans that had jobs all of a sudden were without health care overnight. I think that suggests that something's got to give here. And I think a lot of the strategies that we need to discuss today should vector around how to make sure all of those perspectives are being reconciled respectfully and in an attempt to ensure that workers have an ability to access this work without sacrificing the innovation that's creating this work. Thanks so much. You brought up some really great points, including that innovation uh, and technology and advancements this is a fantastic thing in so many ways. And so I think that the question is, what does it look like for us to keep up with it in terms of how policy uh, fits into the, you know, the ways in which our lives are changing? 
Uh, and I think that that's um, a really exciting thing for us to look into in, in, in addition to what does that mean in terms of safety nets or supports um, that go along with that. Um, I, I wrote a piece a few years ago uh, on what I called kind of policy holes where we hadn't really kept up with the different ways in which um, we are changing the way we do all sorts of things. Uh, technology, advancement, innovation, these are all can be fantastic things and we just have to think about like, what does it look like to make it work well? Mary, hello. Um, hello. <laughs> the, um, the kind of story of what where you fit into this conversation as well as kind of what brought you into your thinking about it. And if you wanna speak a little bit about kind of the premise behind the book that you co-authored, uh, Ghost Work. Yeah, I mean, uh, policy holes are a good way to think about this, I think. And I, all of us, I, I imagine we agree that one of the challenges before us is that we need to stop thinking of this as a market problem and, and see it as a, as a, a social problem. That there, is, there is no magical um, fix to the situation we're in. It's, it's about looking at this moment. So everything that I have to contribute to this conversation comes from five years studying the lives of people, um, hundreds of people who let us into their day-to-day -day lives, uh, studying the work that they're doing, surveying thousands of people who are doing everything from delivering food to labeling images that are training artificial intelligence to recognize our faces. And the key takeaway is these are not niche jobs that, that go away with automation. It's what's created when tech is applied to any work that can be at least in part sourced, scheduled, managed, shipped, and build through a mix of software, not even that complicated software, and the internet. So if you have an internet connection, every business has learned, what can I break off and hand to somebody who's not present with me right now? That, that I think reveals this world of work that's been burgeoning under you know, the surface that um, perhaps ride hailing apps showed us just the tip of that iceberg, but we literally studied what's everything below that surface. And the, the, the reality of being able to dismantle full-time employment um, is, is really the thing for us to track. I, I feel like we're grappling with what does that mean and we're not paying attention to this collision of that reality meeting a host of other sectors, most importantly, the service sector, which means that you can effectively take any kind of service work and have it distributed to a number of, of, of folks. So some of the key takeaways I just want to put on the table from the research that we did, and this is all coming from listening to workers and observing their lives and also getting a sense of this broader ecosystem. There isn't a single type of worker um, this is a, a key thing to keep in mind because that means we're not looking for a particular person. We're looking at different profiles of work and people can easily occupy these different profiles over the trajectory of time they're in any of these jobs. And those three, those types of work, those three ways of entering these workforces that are all necessary to keeping platform work alive are are folks who are always on, they absolutely are making this a mainstream um, form of income for themselves. Folks who are regulars who come in and out, but they've picked the amount of time they're working on something or what they choose to do. And folks who are experimenting. And there's no way to get to becoming an always on worker without experimenting. So trying to take care of the interests of one of those profiles without acknowledging the myriad ways in which people entering these workforces really means we're, we're always um, fixing one piece of the problem and creating more headaches for other folks. And then also there's this mix of routines that mean there isn't really one way in which people are thinking about what they're doing, but we did find three constants. Everybody was trying to control their schedules to the point made earlier, nobody was seeking flexibility. This was entirely about how do I manage all of the other constraints on my time, taking care of my kids, my elders, pursue other interests. The second thing people were trying to accomplish, they were trying to control what they work on. And I don't think anybody on this call can't relate to wanting that to be the priority of what pays their, their you know, daily bread. And then third, they were trying to control who they worked with. 
you know, I, I absolutely agree with, with Professor Jacobs. This is a reflection of what's not working in uh, formal employment, but we studied India and the United States comparing the two to look at that broader reality of many people are managing these constraints and have these interests in controlling um, who they work with, even if the access to full-time employment is, is not available to them. That means in all cases, all folks who want to organize or advocate for workers have to be assuming there's not a single work site. Everyone's effectively remote um, and they care deeply about connecting with each other. In fact, that was the number one difference in terms of people's earnings that they had connections with other workers. There's not a single employer of record. In most cases, they're operating as folks who are um, self-interested, self-employed, business owners and investors, they diversify their portfolio. They're working for multiple platforms. There's not a single professional identity or career that's unifying folks. And that means they have different investments in what it is they see as common ground and, and common cause. And they're always gonna be operating with this sense of whether this is meeting those, those other needs that they have. The value of these systems is their collective contribution. I would argue we have yet to discover the economic model that really fully appreciates and values somebody contributing that moment of snap judgment, but also being available at any moment. That's really different, right? So hopefully what we learn to do is to think about these laws addressing any working age person that's contributing value and that we're paying for collectively and appreciating their availability to us. That, that defines the service sector. It is about availability. And we have yet to really fully take in uh, paying for that and what that means. Mm -hmm. There's so many elements to unpack here. One of the things that I've heard all of you talk a little bit about is how things are, are changing in terms of, of, of work and what people want and need, uh, but also talking a little bit about how things are in, in some ways staying the same in terms of the basics of what we're ultimately trying to accomplish when we, when we work in general. Um, and I appreciate, Mary, your sharing a little bit about kind of what are the things that you were seeing in terms of what people were really trying to ask for and trying to get to happen as they get their daily bread. Um, Vikram, I'd love to direct a question toward you. You know, people always talk about COVID has changed everything. Well, in a way, it hasn't. It was only really just kind of shown a light, all right? It's highlighted some of the different things that were problematic or challenging obstacles from, from before. But I think it's taught us a little bit about um, the safety net in general, right? So I'd love to hear your thinking about what are some of the connections you're seeing to how work has been upended both through, through COVID or just in general? And what are some of the things you're seeing in terms of what that means for legislative protect protections or safety net protections in general? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm in, unfortunately in that category of COVID has changed everything because I feel like my Taco Bell consumption while I've worked from home has gone up. But it, from, from a safety net perspective, I think it has shined an incredible light on, on what is not working with worker protections right now. Um, if you think about, um, you know, that stat that I mentioned before, 5.5 million, at least 5.5 million Americans lost access to uh, health care. They had a job one day, they lost a job the next because of pand pandemic in induced frustration of the economy. And then all of a sudden they were without that health care. That's a safety net that is not working because even if you can call a pandemic an edge case, um, even the Democratic pr uh, primary fight of 2019 showcased that whether you're on the camp of Medicare for all or more moderated Medicare for all who want it, or maybe in the in the President Biden camp of maybe mild tweaks and adjustments to the ACA, maybe it should have a public option. All of those suggest that there should be an undergirding safety net that workers have access to irrespective to their definition of whether they get a W-2 job or not. And I think this is much bigger than worker classification. And it's much bigger than what a mild tweak to worker classification through the PRO Act or mild tweaks to, to what happened in California that Prop 22 can accomplish alone. And I think we need to have a very clear idea about that problem statement that we're trying to go after here. At the same time though, I think I wanna heed 
Cecilia's advice that this should be a worker first conversation. It would be a mistake then to ignore, you know, my prior employer Postmates, when we surveyed workers, 89% of workers out of a sample size of 3000 suggested that they only work three to five hours per week. So it would be a mistake to suggest that all of a sudden every single one of those workers wants to be an employee. At the same time, it would also be a mistake to not necessarily invest, as Kung laid out, in worker power that gives workers more of a voice in the conversation about those outcomes. That solution doesn't involve these binary entrenched camps in which you have a tech defense of a business model in one camp and you have kind of a labor critique in another camp. It requires midwifing some solutions here. And I think that's, that's really, really important because when we talk about flexibility or we talk about the positive externalities of being able to work with other people, if you examine the worker approach, particularly in low barriers of entry to work, you can consider the nonviolent drug offender who maybe is finding difficulty getting a full-time work because some employers aren't willing to take a chance on them based off of their background, but all of a sudden is able to download an app and within 55 minutes get paid out. That's a better alternative for that worker in one instance, and it might even be a better alternative to someone who otherwise has to go seek a predatory payday loan if they need cash and demand or they get hit with an unexpected medical bill. Um, so there are advantages to this low barrier of entry model, and I do kind of want to speak about the, the safety net issues in just two quick ways. First is what California did, and, and I hate to um, kind of create a, a direct uh, point counterpoint response with Ken, especially as a Berkeley alumni myself, I feel like professors are going to yell at me for doing this, but if you think about what California did, it took this vision of work, and it has you know, Postmates had 170,000 couriers in the state of California. Uh, Ford Motor Company has 190,000 employees globally. So if you were to all of a sudden force these companies, many of those workers of which were only working a couple of hours a week into a full-time employment mold, that the weight of that, we would instantly become the largest employers on the planet overnight. And the weight of that wouldn't be able to be sustained, particularly when workers were looking to this work during pandemic to earn. And a lot of restaurants were looking to these platforms in order to deliver. And so we had to think about an alternative approach. And so, you know, there's a minimum wage approach under the employment law model in California that if we stuck with the status quo, workers would receive. What Prop 22 does is actually allocates a higher minimum wage. There's a healthcare approach, which under Obamacare, you can access if you work 30 hours per week. But what Prop 22 did was actually give you access to that healthcare at only working 15 hours per week. Workers' compensation has, is often a challenge. What Prop 22 did was actually create workers access to $1 million worth of accident insurance on the job. Now, that is just a, a quick defense of something that I clearly participated in, and I think that created a step function forward for this debate. But what it hasn't addressed is what we think about a durable path forward for meaningfully addressing what Americans truly care about, which is a chance to work, take care of your families, and what comes next. And so what we need to actually consider is an alternative model where you're able to not necessarily dwell on this binary of destroying work or necessarily keeping work, but how do we actually improve the standards of this work? And what that means, in my opinion, is raising the state of the wages, raising the state of the access to healthcare, but also giving workers a chance to actually have a voice in that dialogue. And right now, simply by saying that you're going to convert workers into employment models may just only destroy that work. So what you really need to do is have workers, worker advocates, and tech companies and governments come together and figure out how is there a path for these workers to actually collectively bargain? How is there a path to do this in a way that protects the business model? And how is there a path to do that um, in a way that actually improves the standard of work? And I think this false narrative of either destroying it or keeping it as a status quo is going to be a broader problem that doesn't address those 5.5 million Americans that still have with a, a lack of health care because they lost their job. That's the problem we're going to here. And it would be silly to just blame the tech companies in one way out of this. I want to thank you, Jim, because you've made this juicy and you are, are already kind of making this into a ball game. I saw Kin kind of shaking his head. So I think he has some thoughts to say, let's share. I saw Mary uh, putting something into the chat talking about, let's stop hedging. Let's just talk about what we need. But Cecilia, I will go to you first because you had something you wanted to add in. 
I'll, I'll make it really fast. I mean, I think what that this speaks to is the notion that you can't really have the conversation about what happens to work and workers absent from the converse, the broader policy conversation about what is the kind of economy that we need and what are the kinds of supports that government needs to invest in to make sure that human beings have, starting with healthcare. I completely agree with the comment that Mary put in the chat. Um, but some of the other supports as well, like compensation when you're injured and like retirement, right? The things that we used to count on that my father was able to count on the Ford Motor Company where he worked for 40 years to provide um, but which th that's just not happening in the workplace any longer. Some of that is a matter for large scale federal level public policy. And if, the, if we collectively stand up for each other to do that, it also creates more room for the kind of, kinds of innovations that Vikram and others are talking about um, in, in the workplace. Thanks. Ken, did you have anything you wanted to share? Um, sure. <laughs> I think there are a couple of really important points here. First is just, I think we should be honest about the standards, Vikram. You can't say it's 120% of the minimum wage without acknowledging that it only pays for two thirds of the time. And so workers come out well below. What we're talking about here is not, and then turning to these jobs wouldn't work as full-time employment. No one has ever talked about these jobs as full-time employment. We have a service industry that treats people as employees in which many people work part-time. That has never been the issue here. Employment isn't full-time, isn't, isn't by its nature always full-time. The issue is, do workers have access to a basic set of rights and benefits, including health and safety protection on the job? Who has the liability if somebody is injured? You take away the robust workers' compensation and disability insurance and replace it with a pale, very small level of coverage that avoids covering during the time people are between rides. That is taking away those benefits. Now, I think we all agree here that if we had a much more robust safety net overall, that some of these issues become easier. If we have universal health care where Healthcare is not dependent on the job. That makes things much easier in lots of these ways, including in the, in the questions of, of workers' compensation insurance. But we will also always need basic protections around work. And as I think there's other seems to be agreement here. And the best way that's defined is with workers having the power to be a serious part of that decision making. And that means when we look at all of this, it's not just workers should be a seat at the table, they have to come to that table with real power. And so part of things like the PRO Act and expanding it to make sure that it includes gig workers is making sure that not only can they negotiate, but they have the ability to exercise economic power and negotiate that power. And have to agree heartily with, with Cecilia, uh, opening when we look at technology, it's the same set of issues. What we're seeing from technology is not mass destruction of jobs. It's not a question of will people have employment in the future. It's fundamentally become a question about job quality. What will happen to the quality of our jobs through technology? Will it be labor replacing or labor enhancing? Will it be, as we see with Amazon, just a case of speed up and more injury? Or will workers have power at the table as workers are able to, to organize and collectively bargain over those conditions so that those technologies can be used in a way that is supporting workers and the ability to fulfill themselves and, the, and, and best carry out work versus being ways to turn them into machines. Mm -hmm. Kang, I'd love to hear from you on your thinking on all of this. I know with uh, related to kind of the collective power um, um, of workers as well as just some of the things related to the safety net element as well. I, I just wanted to harken back to the, uh, a piece I think we may have talked about the other day, which is that there was a time when your benefits and the like did not necessarily come directly through being an employee somewhere. And so it's interesting to think about like what shifted and how it shifted. But first, I'd love to hear your thoughts as it relates to workers and collective bargaining or collective power. Yeah, I'm all for, you know, uh, 
reinvesting in our safety net, right? And I just also, it, it didn't just happen, right? The safety net happened because of those struggles that I named earlier, right, of dock workers and millions of other workers. It came through worker upheaval and was created as part of that struggle, right? So we also have the ability to recreate and strengthen that here. And I think that fight for healthcare um, that's universal and national is really important. Um, I actually wanna go in a different direction, which I think we're talking a lot about workers, but I actually wanna talk about corporations because they're kind of been invisibilized in this. And that was all of the rhetoric of Prop 22, which I think, you know, like if corporations really wanted to provide healthcare to their workers, they didn't need Prop 20 to do that. They could have done that, right? Prop 22 was really about taking away employee status. That is why corporations needed Prop 22. There was a study, I think Barclays, that showed that Uber would gain 500 or would lose $500 million a year Right, I think Lyft was like two hundred and ninety million dollars a year because um, it, you know if they if they if they didn't win Prop Twenty Two, right? So we got to talk about that. Another thing is the UC Santa Cruz um, study that we did last year. Um, it was representative, not necessarily of the workers, right? But the other side of it, of the labor model, of the work that was being done in San Francisco, we found that seventy percent of those workers were actually working thirty or more hours a week, right? Almost half of them showed that said that they were sometimes working 12 hour days, right? I think that's the flip side. This is actually what the business model is. And that's what's actually unsustainable, not just to workers, right? But to our society. A quick follow up to that. What would you imagine as kind of a, a way of going about it that would work? Like if you could, you know, just kind of a wand and say okay this is how that how it kind of comes together and it could be let's just say the sky's the limit like you can just be like there's a policy everybody gets what they need in this way this is how but the responsibility of employers or this is how they show up to it this is what 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 would be this ideal that you might imagine um i point point folks to mary's chat also and you know her ability to jump in here too i think she laid out some ideas um, and then I would stress the, the right to organize, right? We talk about what is a real worker perspective, you know, and here's these anecdotal stories and here's these studies and these surveys, right? But fundamental to a worker perspective is workers to have an organization. And, you know, a union is an example where ideally people come together and they come up with their perspective. They discuss with each other, they collaborate as Mary says, and they have a democratic decision-making power, right? That to me, that worker organization is also key right, to be able to have a real worker perspective and voice. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much for that. And Mary, uh, just as was noted, I would love for you to talk about kind of what you imagine as how this might actually fit together, you know, in a way that makes sense. Uh, and would love to hear also your take on, I, I know that they can kind of become this juxtaposed, like what corporations need or should do, and what workers need or should do. But if you could kind of take us up and what you think might be a way that works kind of as best as possible. Yeah, I mean, I want to keep pointing to the research that we have that says the business model really hinges on these different types of work. And so keeping that in mind, if we, you know, again, if we think about it, not as platform work, but just work, work that's service work that's drawing on these technologies that are really coordinating um, people showing up when a consumer has a demand. As consumers, if anybody's ever been able to enjoy, you know, takeout food because they were able to call up an order and have that food available to them, that's a version of what we're talking about. I'm thinking about Vikram's call to Taco Bell there. You know, so it's keeping in mind um, something much more mundane, which is if we're going to continue to see the use of technologies to coordinate people being able to meet a request at a moment's notice, and we as consumers get used to that 24 seven service. And I like to draw on the example of healthcare as a place where you can see the value of people being able to, at a moment's notice, be available. So what would it take to make that work dignified and valued as it should be? And it will take really thinking about this broader dynamic of shifting toward depending on people coming in and out in a very dynamic way of serving a range of needs. That means always having access to continuing education, having a suite of benefits that are no longer perks. 
their basic needs to be able to provide a healthy workforce that's going to show up. There are ways to pay for this that are about recognizing this is a collective benefit that corporations get out of available workforces that come and go. So they should be footing the bill and cost sharing. Let's make that possible. It really hinges on a kind of sectoral bargaining uh, model, but there's a desperate unmet need that um, traditional labor could be playing for workers to be able to have somebody protect their identities. So here's a great use of organizing and traditional labor could be providing effectively the protection workers need to keep their identities um, known to their association, to their, to their labor organization, but not just on the Rolodex of any company that really doesn't want the responsibility of, of holding onto that identity. Another basic thing labor organizers could be providing is access to that continuing education and effectively being the broker that protects and buffer, that protects the, the information that they um, need to have on file, but is nobody else's business. So these, these really basic things that if we could just start looking towards the future um, and the present of workers' experiences, and healthcare is a great model for that, that we could see there's so much, um, so much we could be doing differently if we, let go of a fairly old model of a nine to five as the, the right way to work and recognize what are workers themselves trying to achieve when they turn to this kind of work. They're trying to control when they work, what they work on, who they work with. There's, there's a way to support that. That yeah. is so helpful to hear this idea of kind of what is one of the elements of how this kind of comes together and what it looks like to find kind of the right way if there's one such thing but at least the elements of the right way for work to to work um i would love to ask a, just an open-ended question of anybody who wants to jump in on it as what do you see as some of the elements of what makes make this makes this whole kind of issue come together um and I guess my prompt for that would be, is there a policy or are there policy solutions to this? Uh, is this about narrative change? Is this about a completely new way of viewing the social contract? Contract. What are some of the things that you feel like? And I would love for each of you to just kind of think of one, because I'm sure you have many, because I'm sure you have the answer and you were thinking, thank goodness she asked me to be on this webinar because I will now share my answer with the world for this, but this is your moment. So um, maybe I'll start with Ken, did you have a thought related to this? I would start out by, I wanna disagree with Mary a little bit here around work. I think it's important to remember that the last good full study we have of this in the United States is that the that, that this kind of gig work accounts for about two percent of the overall work done uh, in in the the country? That the vast majority of workers work for in in the United States work for employers. They're not necessarily working full time, but they do work for employers, and that that will continue to be the model for the major, vast majority. I believe going into into the future, there's too much to be gained from. Uh, the, the ability, the, the kinds of networking that happens, the, the skills that one learns on the job over time to have all jobs be something that people just move in and out of. And I, I say that because I think when we think, think towards solutions, I would agree that we do need a much bigger safety net and a much stronger safety net across the board. And that is one of the weaknesses. One of the big reasons the United States can't deal with uh, climate change is the way some other European countries are, is because everyone's afraid of any kind of change because there is no underlying safety net there. So that's clear that we need to do. But also we need to strengthen workers' rights. And that include and that means pass the PRO Act or other and other labor law reform law to give workers a much stronger voice on the job, both and that includes in terms of basic rights and benefits and also includes in things like technological innovation. Yeah, if I could jump in here, Adam, I, I think that um, the frame really needs to be that there's a difference between 
the dignity of work and the dignity of a job, right? Nature of work these days might be changing remote work, um, at any types of ways that were maybe more federated from like a core work site, either because of COVID or because of new technologies. And insofar as someone can still both amass, you know, enough means to put food on the table, invest in their own upward mobility, and hopefully leave their kids or their progeny a little better off than they came into this space, that is still a dignified path to work. And what we need to do is not necessarily poo-poo the types of access to work that might offer new configurations, but really just be in the business of collectively, collectively pushing up the standards of that work and how that ends up shaking out. And I think whether we're talking about gig workers that are only a fraction of the overall labor force or the entire of a more traditional W-2 model, the moment that we have workers left out of that safety net, that is undignified work. And we have a responsibility as government, as technologists, as civil society to fill that hole. Contractors don't have access to paid family leave policies in this country, that should change. At Postmates, we actually exact, it, it ran paid family leave policies in California and New York, or New York for workers. Uh, gig workers and 1099s don't have access to lifelong learning accounts. Uh, ben Sass, Senator from, from Nebraska and Senator Klobuchar have a great bill in Congress that would actually create lifelong learning accounts and use a pre-tax, almost an HSA-like vehicle to ensure that we can continue to invest in lifelong career technical training. Um, contractors don't have access to health care. We've interrogated that point quite a bit on this, on this uh, call, or sorry, on this conversation, and that should change also. So I don't think that necessarily because there's a defense of a business model that 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 necessarily means corporations are seeding the fact that that work can and should be better. And Autumn, to be responsive to your point, I think that there are very salient policy solutions. First, there should be enhanced co-determination. Mary's colleagues at Harvard uh, on the Clean Slate Project and some former Obama alumni have actually suggested that maybe corporations should give board seats to workers so that way they have the same fiduciary interests as the corporation does and can weigh in on that. Second, Senator Warner and Congresswoman Del Bene have a phenomenal bill that has been challenged to get passed, but I think we should put our weight behind it that would actually give um, money to state unemployment systems to modernize them and make sure that that stimulus money from the president is doled up faster, but actually would earmark $500 million to experiment with a portable safety net system. I think everyone here has agreed that tying your access to healthcare or retirements to one job and one job alone is an idea that is a relic of the past. And we should pass that bill to ensure that we can get access to portable benefits. And then the last piece for me is actually a complete agreement, I think, with, with Ken and Kung, that we should expand the access to bargaining at a sector-based level, i.e. across the gig economy or other spaces, but make sure that you can invoke independent contractors into that world. I, independent contractors being able to have access to a, pe uh, a table is something I believe in. It is something that we even said when I was an employee of that, of that organization, but current federal law prevents that from happening. Now, of all of these three policy prescriptions, I do wanna say one thing. The reason that I mentioned at the top that it's unique to have someone on this panel that has worked in government, has worked in tech, and now works in civil society, is that if you try and exact any policy prescription that's being discussed here without a deep understanding of either A, how government works, or B, workers work, or C, how the technology works, you're invariably undercutting the position of good, robust, and durable outcomes. And right now, there's never been a history in labor law in the United States or across the world that would allow me to show up at 8 a.m. at my Starbucks shift as a part-time worker, walk across the street mid-shift to the Pete's Coffee because it has a longer line, and I think I might be able to get more tips, and then comes back when that crowd dies down to Starbucks, only to tell my boss a few minutes later, shit, I forgot my homework assignment. Let me go home and finish that, but I'll see you tomorrow. That is literally what the internet has powered now. And all of us who have been in Ubers and Lyfts see both apps open and compensable time under the FLSA is starting to be begged new questions because of advancements in technology, where if you're working for two employers at the same time, who has to pay you for that same time? If you're able to toggle across all of these disparate apps and earn and put together an income that works for you to fulfill that vision of a dignity of work, then we need to make sure that if you pass the PRO Act and that crumbles that business model, or if you think about another approach that allows you to 
retain that business model, but elevate the standards of worker voice through true worker power, through enhanced code determination, through portable benefits and a path to bargaining, that that might just be a more durable path forward, as opposed to completely neglecting the stakeholder perspectives of the technology, as well as the worker voice altogether. Well, there, there's so much there and I really appreciate what you've shared because I feel like that is a really interesting element of, or a interesting way of thinking of kind of the, the specific example of what, what it enables as well as what we are hoping to enable ultimately for, for workers. And the, the interplay between everybody who's in, engaged in this issue, which is more than just the workers. I think sometimes, even though we talk about what we think may not be a full, uh, full-throated voice of the of the workers, there is also kind of elements of government, uh, corporations. This all kind of is it's it's an onion, right? So it's got many layers. Yeah. I would like to ask all of you one kind of final question, if you if you'll uh, permit me, and then I'm going to move to the questions that are coming in from the people who are listening and, uh, and our attendees. So my final question would be. You have this opportunity right now to talk to a number of people who are engaged in this issue one way or the other, whether they are logging in uh, right now as somebody who is uh, cobbling together different types of work, whether they're with a corporation, whether they're in the public sector, whether, you know, whatever their, their vantage point may be. What is it that you would ask them to do uh, what do you want them to know? What do you want them to walk away with and say, aha, here is how I, it's kind of like the call to action, although this is a little different Different when you're thinking about kind of potentially influencing policy or kind of lifting your voice in a, to say something related to this larger narrative. But what is what is it you would want folks to walk away with the aha or to, or to share with the people they know or the people they influence? I will start with Cecilia. So I think the, at least what felt like an aha moment for me was sort of looking at, frankly, the data with respect to what's happening just in terms of income, let alone access to healthcare or other kinds of supports that humans need, um, and to see how bifurcated it's becoming, how, how, how the inequities are growing, um, and to recognize that, that is, that's just unsustainable for us as a society. As you say, Autumn, during the, this last year of crisis, a brighter light has shown on something that has been true and has been happening for a long time. But like we, we, we have watched particular constituencies break under the strain of this moment because access to healthcare was tenuous, because their incomes were tenuous, because their ability to access other things that we normally connect to their work um, you, know, you know, completely disappeared. And it is, it is unsustainable for the health and well-being of society for the gaps to be as big as they are. And that, if you start thinking about it from that perspective, and there are some corporate leaders who are starting to think about it from that perspective, I think we have leaders in government who are thinking at least at, at the federal level and in some states who are thinking about it from that perspective and people who are organizing are making that case. Um, that that's, in some ways, that's the change of heart that we need is that all of these sectors have a stake in, in making life sustainable for, right, for, for people who right now work is not sustaining a life in which you have caregiving responsibilities and you have to have a roof over your head and you have to have enough food. It's just not. Um, and, and that for the long-term health of our society, for our economy is, is is unsustainable. And that's a thing we kind of have to get in the boat and start rowing in the same direction to, to achieve. Thanks. How about you, Mary? I love thinking of it as getting on the boat and rowing together, because I, I feel like one of the most important things I would hope um, I could argue with the research we have is we're not talking about niche jobs. We are not talking about a small slice of the pie. We are talking about what happens when technologies are continued to be applied to different sectors to be able to source, manage, bill, ship, anything. And that's been happening since outsourcing. So working with that reality and seeing that means we should be equipping anybody working in the world today 
with a set of basic benefits so that they can enter the workforce is the policy work ahead of us to not think it's just one, one industry or one way of working. And I would just leave you all with thinking about not the, the taxi driver or the food deliverer, but the person caring for your parents. Like the future of this is thinking about care work. It's what are we going to do to take care of the people who are going to be caring for us? Because that is the largest growth area in work. And it is both very local and incredibly global. It will be done through telehealth and it'll be done in um, the care of your parents' home. So have that in mind. Not, not a dude who's rushing from Starbucks to Pete's, no offense, Vikram, but think about, you know, think about a woman who's caring for your kids and your, and your family. Thanks for that, Mary. As you were talking, I was actually signaling to my daughter who was coming up to get a uh, boiled egg so she could go back down and do her Zoom. And my parents have relocated here to Oakland and uh, perhaps are even tuned in. So yeah, there are lots of elements of what it looks like to try to balance all the different things that we all try to balance to um, you know, get an income and to be able to not just survive, but thrive. Uh, Kong, I would love to hear your thoughts. Sure. Um, I'd want to push back on sort of this idealized version of walking from Pete's Coffee to Starbucks, right? Like people are actually working 12 hours and being homeless in their cars, right? The image I have in my mind when I think about gig work is what happened to the DoorDash worker working in San Francisco who was juggling all these things, right? And had his two children in the car who were kidnapped while he was walking up to try and make a delivery and try and make a living, right? And underneath that, I think the thing that I would leave folks with is the right to organize. And so it doesn't mean talking about worker power in the abstract. We can make that concrete. We can pass the PRO Act. We can step outside our house and learn about the ways that workers are actually struggling and in movement and making their jobs better, right? The domestic workers who are fighting for health and safety in the California state legislature. There's the fight food, uh, sorry, there was a fight for 15 fast food workers action in San Francisco. They're fighting for the fast food act in the state of California. There are real lived concrete ways that we can support and be part of this change and fight along some people who are leading this work. And I think the fundamental value Mary touched on, right? is valuing work. During the pandemic, I think there was this whole trope around essential work. The truth is work has always been essential to the function of a society, caring for elders, teaching our children, driving buses, right? And we have to understand that and we have to reflect on that and we have to let workers lead the charge to actually valuing the own work that they do. Um, just one last offer is this also not, it's not just for workers, it's for our society, right? When we work, we're producing values, we're producing products and services, but we're also producing ourselves. Like what kind of people do we become in a society where we are valued and where we have power? Wow, uh, it's interesting when you talk about the essential work element of it or the term essential work. I, in, in the back of my head, I had this piece that I had planned to write for the last like year about just a meditation on the term essential and essential workers. Like what is essential to workers, but also what is essential in terms of what we need from workers, but also what is essential to workers themselves. And I, I was thinking about that element you just brought up, which is that workers are residents, workers are people, workers are really all of us, Like right? Like it's so, it, it, to put it into this like little category of workers is everybody, right? It's all of us trying to figure out how um, we have our needs met as well as when, we, when we've talked about it more recently, we've talked about what it is that the workers bring to, to society, but we also need to think about what, what is necessary uh, that we provide to workers, which is ultimately all of us. Vikram, what would you like to share? I, I, I wanna, um, first of all, I, I think everything that was said so far is very insightful and definitely an aha moment for me. Mine sort of piggybacks a bit off of the rowing together concept. Um, because as someone that has uh, worked inside of a corporation, I think the ultimate takeaway is we should expect and demand more of corporations. Um, you know, there's very interesting data that's come out in the last several months that has shown trust in government kind of on the decline, but faith in, institute, in corporate institutions has increased, not necessarily because 
they're always making the best calls or having the right practices, but just because we find a lot of kinship in our workplaces or the uniforms that we wear when we show up for these companies day to day. And I think that we can and should expect more of not just companies in the gig economy alone, but wanting to do the right thing, which to Kung's point much earlier in the conversation doesn't always require legislation. Right? like companies can show up in certain ways, provide certain benefits and make sure that they're lifting up workers full stop. And I think that that is one thing that both worker power can, can try and address, but also just consumer purchasing power can try and address day to day. Um, but to, to really honor Cecilia's point um, in terms of, of rowing together, what we need to do is really stop or end this very uncivil war that pits workers against capital. Right, like tech against labor unions, conservative versus at liberal, Bessemer versus the rest of the country. And I think lasting generational change that delivers true economic justice is cognizant of the racial dynamics that was spoken to earlier and delivers true upward mobility for workers is really rooted in an understanding that we're a lot better off if we work together um, and with each other as working partners, not against one another as sparring partners. And I'm concerned that in the way that we've seen these new technologies come on the scene and those that advocate concerns for that technology on the scene aren't in a room together rolling up their sleeves trying to suss this out. I'm excited that maybe the Biden administration might try and create the space for even aside from the PRO Act, aside from whatever the Department of Labor does in terms of promulgating rules about contractor versus employees, the chance to actually say automation is changing work in this way. Should we take a cue from Germany and create more apprenticeship programs that create a feedback loop of that new automation at the university level or downstream at the K through 12 level? Gig work is changing work this way. Should we get in a room where tech and labor can actually talk about how to balance the business model with a path to sectoral or collective bargaining? That type of engagement, that type of camaraderie, that's how we row together. And I'm really, really encouraged by the fact that there are voices out there calling for it, but it's going to take a lot more momentum behind those voices because those voices tend to be a little bit in the minority from time to time. Thanks so much for that. It's, it's interesting also to think about, you know, how we structure a conversation, how we ultimately make kind of the narrative about what this is ultimately about when it might actually differ from what might be the true kind of crux of the issue. Um, what we ultimately may need in terms of the solution is, is easier to at least move toward when there's a clearer understanding of what, what's really kind of at stake and what the kind of levers are, um, as opposed to simplifying it or oversimplifying it into just you know workers versus capital or, or corporations versus, versus workers. Uh, Ken, I would love to hear your thoughts. Sure. I, I think the, the key thing that comes out of all of this is how this is fundamentally a question of power. And that what we've seen it, it, since the late 1970s was an increase in the power of corporations and a decline in the power of workers and, form, and decline in, in unionization. And that brought with it that increase in income inequality that Cecilia so eloquently discussed. And so when I look at Proposition 22 and see that a corporate set of corporations can spend $200 million to create their own law to govern their own workplaces in a way that keeps the, and that stops the state of California from being able to create its own collective bargaining law around these, these workers. It makes it very clear just the, the what the, that is the threat that is in terms of having a functioning democracy. And so I think what's so important in, we, in thinking towards the future are the kinds of measures that increase workers' ability to organize, to bargain collectively. And that's necessary both for the economic power they have at the table in terms of their own jobs, but also as a collective power in terms to be that countervailing force to big business in politics in America. And what we've seen since the late 1970s is that corporate voice really took over. We saw that explosion in inequality. And the only way we balance that is by having robust institutions of workers that can bring their voice to the table, but not just as a voice, but a voice with power. But you'll you'll never find me agreeing with uh, oh, excuse me disagreeing. You'll never find me disagreeing with uh, a statement that talks about the need for people to have more power. 
So <laughs> I very much appreciate that. I'm gonna segue into some of the questions that I see here. Uh, one is related to, uh, it's centered around this idea of how workers can have power and collectively bargain when they are part of a distributed and isolated workforce. And the element of this that I find really interesting is are there any strategies that you think exist for employing technology to facilitate workers sharing information and forming shared narratives in a distributed workforce? So what I'm hearing there is this idea of like, could technology actually be used for this idea of elevating power and having workers kind of come together even if their, their uh, industry is distributed? Oh, Mary, I think um, if you want to use Yeah, I, I just wanted to share something from our research, which was, uh, and I, I, I said this, uh, um, glossed over it maybe too quickly, is that we're collectively and connecting um, the collective interests of people was by far the, the thing that all the workers we talked with um, pointed to as the, the thing that was their saving grace, like the thing that kept them from being just pulled down through this, this undertow um, was connecting with each other. And there were really good examples of solidarity building. The, the, the key thing missing as to what Professor Jacobs was just noting, the key thing missing was the power to make that matter at, um, at the table. You know, so workers being able to collectively organize, they're there, we just need to give them the, um, the, the rest of the runway um, to connect with, um, with their, their political voice. So they're already doing it. Technology is already facilitating that. Uh, the problem is we don't have policies that recognize them as a sector. And if I could just add to that, the National Domestic Workers Alliance has really pioneered both strategies for connecting these are you know among the most isolated of workers right individuals who work in other people's homes both into a collective um, but also leveraging technology to develop a, a, an approach to some level of benefits paid leave for example and um uh and sort of workers comp type protections using a platform that they created called alia which essentially allows if you are a um, a worker in a household that it essentially it relies on the worker to persuade their employer to kick in an extra five bucks for a fund that ultimately will pay for paid leave. But it's a really it's an early and really innovative use of technology to connect pretty isolated workers to benefits. That's fantastic. And thanks for bringing that up, uh, Cecilia, Alia, and what the National Domestic Workers Alliance is up to. Anyone else on that specific point? Just have a quick other example of um, Marriott workers, Marriott hotel workers, housekeepers in um, Oakland, for example, who organized and won the use of a uh, panic safety button so that they could report and you know seek uh, aid if if they were subject to sexual assault during the course of their work. Um, so I, I really underscore, I think, Cecilia's point that workers can shape technology. Technology is not just an inevitable, inevitable thing that happens to us, right? But it's a product that people have made. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. <clears throat> There's a question here that I think is interesting considering how much we've talked about how um, multifaceted this issue is. And it is one just, just what, like what is the clear, if there is such a thing, uh, problem statement here? Is this an issue of affording workers with better protections um, with the actual employee categories laid out in the law, or is it the appropriateness of using employee status category categories for allocation worker protections? So I guess we were kind of rounding about to, if, if you had to kind of sum up, you were in an elevator and you were saying like, this is what this is, what is the problem statement here ultimately? I'll just say, if we could literally let go of categories of workers defining workers' rights, that anybody who's a working age adult in their families has a right to the things that to date we felt are a, a perk of employment, that would make all the difference. If we, if we start setting that floor, 
for any working age adult, no matter where they work, how long they work, what they're doing, that there's a fundamental set of um, a bundle of rights that go with that. What a difference that would make for, for anyone who's entering the workforce. So they don't have to depend on their employer being the right employer or in the right state or doing the right kind of job. Like that, you know, that's a luxury for me to say that, but to me, that would make all the difference if we work towards that vision. I, I completely agree. Um, I know I may be playing sort of the, the role of corporate villain in this conversation, but I, I, I think that the problem statement is that uh, since World War II, as I said earlier, we, we have a safety net that gives workers, some workers, some benefits and many workers, no benefits. And that needs to change. And I think um, it doesn't just require an examination of the gig economy. I think that's a little too narrow in Aperture. Um, millennials that change jobs faster than ever before, Gen Zers are switching jobs faster than ever before, caregiving, which as, as my parents get to a certain age is certainly on my brother and my mind daily. Uh, that is very vital to focus on. And if there are gaps in the safety net and maybe some of the laws of the past didn't contemplate these newer technologies, I think it's okay for us to all have hat in hand a conversation about how we just make sure all those workers get access to all of those benefits. Any other thoughts on this, of the problem statement? Okay. I will go to another question, which is interesting, which is related to the relationship. How would you explain the relationship between labor law in the US and human rights? I would just say Human Rights Watch did an important paper a number of years back looking at that as labor rights as a human right and recognizing that the actions that we see in, in terms of many corporations in America, especially around the, the right to organize and violations of the right to organize, importance of seeing those as human rights violations. Right now in America, when workers seek to organize and bargain collectively, just watch this in Bessemer with Amazon, the kinds of actions that companies take uh, to stop workers from organizing uh, are tremendous and in, in terms of the ability to, to create fear. Um, and part of that is there is no punitive uh, fines or viola for violations of labor law in America today. If you fire somebody illegally for uh, working, trying to organize an, a, a union, you can be uh, required to post a notice saying you'll never do it again, to hire the person back or, and to pay back wages minus any earnings they may have had in another job since they were fired. Uh, what companies figured out was you can just delay and delay uh, because you, and you let turnover work to your, your benefit and then just violate the law with impunity. And we have a whole industry of labor, of uh, anti-labor consultants who work with employers to in, in doing this. And so I think it is important that we think of labor rights and rights on the job as human rights, and that we create the kind of laws that allow workers to organize and bargain collectively, and that where it is not the role of the employer to engage at all in that election process when workers are making that decision. It should be a decision of workers themselves. Mm -hmm. There's an interesting question uh, here. It's, uh, it says, as someone who watched the Proposition 22 campaign closely, I noted that the workers themselves voted heavily in favor of the proposition. Why isn't it that workers exercising their voice in a participatory de democratic process <clears throat> isn't the view that the TV ads convince people to vote against their self-interest deeply insulting to the workers who overwhelmingly voted against the AB5 model. I mean, that's the $200 million question. <laughs> I don't think it's a participatory democracy as you put it. You know, there's a huge influence of money. I mean, there's many examples of that. Um, I do wanna back up. There is a problem statement that I think is really important, which is 
uh, I'll just name it, structural racism and gender oppression. Um, and that's also key to undoing. It's not just categories based on employment status, right? But, you know, people who are excluded were farm workers and domestic workers from some of those early programs in the 1930s. And that's because they were primarily black, right? Um, domestic workers, obviously work done by women, you know, service workers, you know, undervalued because they were also work that's sort of traditionally uh, done by women, right? Um, these are some of the things that we also have to overcome if we're talking about human rights. Yeah, I, I would um, uh, under, I, I echo that. I think that's a very, very important frame through all of this. And, and more recently, um, given my new role at the ACLU, I think, you know, another in the category of policy prescriptions here, we need to seriously take a look at the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, um, a bill that that is in, in front of Congress, but, you know, TBD on whether it passes or moves yet, because, you um, it, it does speak to the fact that a lot of essential workers during the pandemic ended up um, being black and brown women. Many of them were pregnant, didn't have the right to fair accommodations at the work site, and being able to expand existing protection should be elements of, of our dialogue to, to have a path to, to labor fairness and economic justice. Um, I also think Ken's point on labor rights as human rights is a really important framework and something that we could all benefit from more. Um, it's interesting, though, that that in a commentary on on voting and you know electoral outcomes, you know, you, if you had fifty nine percent of Californians vote for something, and you had um, you know mothers groups ranging from mothers against drunk driving to the NAACP showing up in a coalition supporting it, um, but yet there's still so much questions in the aftermath of this. I think it goes to show that that solution alone doesn't end this conversation, right? And it kind of goes back to the importance of needing to row together and the importance of what Mary was saying, that if we're talking about labor rights as human rights, we really need to expand them to all workers, irrespective of, of what your tax filing status is at the end of the year. Um, and hopefully as we continue to have more of a, a social justice reckoning in this country, um, all the intersectionality of these different concepts and, and issue sets, whether it's on pregnant workers or it's on racial justice or it's on sectoral bargaining, will all sort of come to light in, in rooms and spaces where people can feel heard. And we don't prioritize strength over solutions, but we actually start prescribing a path forward that balances these different stakeholder perspectives. Thanks so much for that. And Kung, I see you put a comment into the chat. If you wanted to share that, um, feel free to do so. Well, I mean, just basically the $200 million went to shaping the narrative. So it was about workers' rights, which, you know, actually was about, you know, this business model that, you know, app corporations had that was trying to get off the hook for AB5. So the issue as defined, you know, that people were voting on was not actually the issue that was contained in Prop 22. But mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of sentiment and agreement here around the safety net. So. I do want to point to that as a point of, you know, collaboration. Well, with this, I would like to ask each of you if you have a closing thought uh, as we wrap up the end of this conversation. Uh, if you have one, by all means, share it. And if not, feel free to just pass. If you've all said so many really, um, really profound, you shared so many profound thoughts with us. Uh, I understand if you're like, I've already given it to you. But if you have something else that you'd like to add, please do so. And I will start with uh, Vikram. Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> yeah. What an amazing conversation. And uh, honestly, an honor to, even if, if there's differences of opinion, an honor to stand by um, Kong and Cecilia and Ken and Mary. Uh, and you, Autumn, the body of work New America Foundation has put out in this space is, is really important and continues to be very instructive to a lot of our thinking. I mean, at the end of the day, I think my main takeaway is that when it comes to governing new forms of work moving forward, um, we, we really need to have tours of duty where you know people in Congress that are wagging their fingers at future CEOs understand the product and understand what they're actually talking about. And similarly, people within the ranks of tech companies um, are looking at ROI numbers that aren't just about the bottom line, but are looking about the stakeholders in their communities and the downstream impacts that their technology is confronting. And so I think the next few years, we're going to really need to, as a society, if we want to talk about economic justice, not just celebrate these new apps and their convenience um, or these new technologies and their efficiency gains, but really understand how that algorithm is, is 
creating worker outcomes and really understanding, getting into the guts of the code and getting into the guts of the product in order to understand how to make smart balance regulations as opposed to kind of sweeping value statements. But um, I'm confident that if, if, if labor organizers, a UC Berkeley professor, uh, a White House um, alumni and, and a Harvard group can get together with the tech a tech alum and agree on the path to bargaining for workers that I'm, I'm hopeful and optimistic for a lot of that change going forward. Fantastic, thank you. Cecilia. Not sure there's much I can say to top that, except to say that this, look, this, these issues are complex and the frames that we're used to dealing with them in are not sufficient anymore. So this require, is gonna require us being creative, but also really deciding that we want to grow in the same direction. And I'm, I'm hopeful about our ability to do that. Thank you so much. Ken. Yeah, just, again, thank you for putting this panel together today. And I think I want to echo something Kung brought in towards the end, that when we look at strategies that lift up the floor, that provide a broad range of benefits, and that increase workers' power and labor rights, will benefit all workers and all working all families in America, but the bit largest effects will be on black and indigenous people of color who have uh, been hurt the most by our existing system. And so I think this, these are vital issues that we need to tackle. Thank you so much. And Kang. Um, yeah, so much, I mean, really great to be on the panel. Uh, with all these folks have learned a lot from reading your books, from talking with you, um, from having coffee with Vikram. Um, I, I think it's true that the legal frameworks change, right? And that actually they're a product and a symptom of our power relationships, ultimately. Um, and that what's consistent, I think, hopefully that we all share is the values, right? So those human rights, the rights of you know, women workers and you know, gender oppressed people, the rights of BIPOC workers, um, of every worker who's always essential. And that's what guides us in, in this conversation. Um, I would also say it's also, you know, in terms of legal frameworks, there's a big question. Do we let billionaires and app corporations with billions of venture capital write those legal frameworks? or can workers write them? And I agree, there's a stakeholder process like what Vikram said, but fundamental to a stakeholder process that's real is if workers have power. So what they walk into that room, what do they walk out with, right? And that's, that's the groundwork, I think, for any stakeholder process. Thank you so much. And Mary. We are at the very beginning of this change. And I try to remind anyone I'm around that the capacity to be able to do this kind of disaggregation and distribution of work at such a rapid speed and scale is literally no more than 10 years old, you know, 15 tops. So we're at the very beginning of this moment when we can rethink everything and I forgot to mention that in our research, we studied companies that were doing things differently. And the biggest differentiator is when you prioritize the quality of a work condition for people entering these worlds of work, you get better outcomes. So let the workers lead the direction and everybody wins. Everybody does better in these markets. So that to me is the, the goal here is to listen and learn from the way people do their work and what is it they're trying to achieve. And we will, we will address our, our greater needs as consumers and businesses that follows. So follow the workers, that's, that's, where, that's where change is at. Well, I certainly can't top what each of you have said. So I will just say thank you to all of you. Thank you to the MacArthur Foundation and thank you to everyone who tuned in. Have a great day.